Scary Cryptid Encounters Story 1. The Wampus This is my eyewitness account of what I believe I encountered was a wampus cat. I was in North Carolina, hiking around out in the woods, and my friend and I spotted this very large black thing on all fours, moving around on top of this small ridge. We were tucked down in the valley below, eating cliff bars, talking amongst ourselves of where we wanted to go next, when my friend looks and points out this animal. Now, let's be clear. I've seen mountain lion and cougar, which are interchangeable. I've seen them many times in my life. Nothing new. So to see this was intriguing, because it didn't fit the descriptions of a cougar or mountain lion. Not only was this feline, or what appeared to be a feline, much larger than a cougar, it was also jet black, kind of like a panther. But if you've ever seen a panther in a picture, and I know most of us have, it didn't quite fit that description either. The issue that I had with it, right off the bat, was just how dark it was. Like I said, it wasn't like a black panther, where it's just black. It was so dark that it's like the light around it was absorbed, as you say. And even the way this feline moved, I can only assume it was a feline, because I'm assuming it was indeed a wampus cat. It walked a little ways further. Then it stopped, as if frozen like a statue. Then, looked over in our direction, like it was alerted to us looking at it. That's when we knew for sure this was something, not a cougar. It had glowing white eyes, and this was in the evening time, maybe 4 or 5 p.m. The sun had not even fully lowered in the sky yet, casting a different lighting, creating this sort of illusion. What we were seeing was very real. This was not a ghost, it was not an apparition, it was not some sort of misidentification. It was clear, and this wampus cat, which I'm assuming it was, was maybe only 70 yards away, and we had a very clear view of it. The only real reason my friend even pointed it out to me in the first place was because of the clarity of the view, as was I saw it. We weren't scared, we were just kind of amazed that that's what we saw. Once it looked over in our direction, it turned its head back and continued walking smoothly into the woods and then disappeared. I think the biggest takeaway here is just the absolute shock at how large this creature was. I mean, I'm not kidding. When I say big, I mean big. We're talking a feline of considerable and substantial size. Even we can tell that from our distance, it had an enormous shoulder span, but its movements were unusually smooth, and its speed was exorbitant for the amount that it moved its limbs. Kind of like it glided, if that makes any sense to you. My friend who first pointed it out to me said that, Wow, I think we just saw a wampus cat. I didn't know what a wampus cat was. He had to educate me. As far as I knew, there was no such thing as a large black panther-like feline running around here in the woods of North Carolina. But clearly, I was wrong. He explained to me that there are other things called cryptids besides just Bigfoot. And Bigfoot and Sasquatch also fall into this category. That was news to me. I had no idea that they were called cryptids. He went on to explain that there's other creatures in the water, on land, and in air. That fall in this category, the Mothman being another one, but then went on to explain the Wampus Cat, one that is said to be right around this region, like Bigfoot being akin to the Pacific Northwest. The entire thing is very interesting, and I'm curious to see what your speculation and opinion come to. As for me, judging by what he knows, and even doing my own research later on, I kind of can't help but come to the same conclusion. What other answers could there be? Story 2. Rock Apes Hello, What Lurks Beneath. 
I'm a little bit older, but I still enjoy tuning into your show nearly nightly for all the crazy, scary encounters you have to share. I have a pretty good one for you, and I don't know if you've ever covered this subject before. I guess it falls in line with Bigfoot and Sasquatch, but this is on a whole other level. You see, I served in the Vietnam War when I was much, much younger. In fact, I was a new recruit, and I had been assigned to the MACV SOG recon team, assigned to the Bong San plane. I worked as a specialist and a radio operator. This is how I happened to be on the mission. I just returned from another mission and was ordered to go on a reconnaissance mission to a location of a possible enemy base camp. We were to go as far as we could and report back on any signs of enemy activities. There were eight of us in total. We were a team. We were each assigned to go to several different locations. We were told that we would be gone for a total of four days and three nights. To help us on our way, we were given a compass and a map, as well as other materials and rations. We also had weapons. I had an extra pistol and a knife. We were told that we might run into trouble and to shoot to kill, as well as other rations like canteens and food. We also had to carry all of our gear. Our first meeting point was about five miles, and in the thick human jungles, that's a lot tougher than you could think. When we arrived, we were supposed to set up camp and wait for the rest of the team. When I got to the meeting point, I did not have enough time to set up. I was told to set up a perimeter around the area. I was also told that I was to be on active guard duty. So, I set up a perimeter. I went from tree to tree, and I was to check the area for anything unusual. I was worried the enemy would take us by surprise. In case of an ambush, I was to give off a warning firing for my rifle, then to retreat into the camp for the time being. I was also informed to be alert for the many signs of booby traps. I was told to not touch anything that looked remotely suspicious. If I saw anything, I was to alert the others. Quick note, one thing you had to be careful of in the jungles was falling into what I called spike pits. These were pits dug out by the Viet Cong soldiers. They would be anywhere from 5 to 10 feet deep, filled with sharpened bamboo that soldiers would fall and impale themselves on. What's worse is these sharpened bamboo spikes were usually covered in things like urine and feces, ultimately not only impaling the U.S. soldiers, but leading to die of infection. Not a good way to go. I knew several good men that perished this way. It's pretty grisly. But the one thing that I was very, very thoroughly warned about up front were these animals called the rock apes, or so my superior officer called them. He informed me that while these creatures resembled monkeys, they were far more dangerous and extremely strong. He said they not only lived in the jungles, but high up in the mountains. They were extremely hard to kill, had a very good sense of smell, very intelligent, very agile, and can kill a man with their bare hands, teeth, and claws. These were creatures not to be messed with. So that's when night came. I fell asleep in our small tent, since our entire camp was filled with several. There was maybe about 12 of us in total, since we had conjoined with another small team. I was awakened by the sound of fellow soldiers panicking. I woke up, jolted awake by thinking we were about to be under fire, when instead, something much more horrifying was about to happen. The entirety of the camp erupted into chaos. I look outside my tent and saw several of us running around, some screaming, some yelling. I jumped up, and that's when I saw these things. I will never forget this for the rest of my life. There were these beings jumping out of the jungles 
at the front perimeter of the camp. These things were huge, a few feet taller than the average man. They were covered in long, straggly hair and had faces that looked like half monkey, half man. Bulging black eyes. They kind of had a face more akin to that of a baboon, if you will, but still more humanoid, just not the same coloring. Leathery skin, more darker browner flesh. These things had long, sharp teeth, though, very different than that of a baboon, and long claws. The first soldier to perish had his throat torn out. The other one, one of these things just grabbed the man's head, twisted it like it was a piece of napkin. And these things were being fired at. One of the GIs had a knife and tried stabbing it. He had his arm nearly twisted off and thrown back where he fell unconscious. It's like they weren't even really phased by bullets. Not that they weren't taking hits and bleeding, because that was happening. And several of them were retreating back into the jungles. But some of them, it's like a bullet or two, was nothing to them. I even wonder how all of us survived. In total, we lost about five men. After a small skirmish, they all retreated and disappeared back into the jungle. Five men lost in total, while three needing immediate medical care. The head officer demanded we stay in camp and stay alert. We were strictly informed to not leave the camp perimeter. There might be more of them. We were all put on guard, keeping out for more of these things. Shortly after, we could hear these things roaming around in the jungle just outside the perimeter of our camp, making horrible sounds, screaming, yelling. It was unlike anything I had ever heard back in the United States. And I used to go hunting when I was younger with my pa, for deer, mainly, and rabbits sometimes. It's unlike anything you could ever imagine hearing. Think like a human scream, but much, much deeper and different. The rest of that night, we were on high alert. I later on found out that one of the fellow soldiers, it wouldn't be till a little while later, where I would find out that one of the soldiers who had died that evening infringed and trespassed on this thing's territory, or several of theirs, because from the way my officer made it sound like, the one who informed me is that once that infringement was made, these things in full force came chasing after him. Not all the way back to the camp, though. No. They waited. They strategized. They were intelligent beings. Enough to realize that now was not the best time to strike. Wait until night, to when they all fall asleep, or most of them. That's when they would attack. And that's exactly what they did. The fact that these animals, apes, whatever you want to call them, possessed near-human level intelligence to strategize and assemble like that should be very concerning. Now, being as old as I am, I'm well aware of the Bigfoot Sasquatch phenomenon here in the US. I've never seen one myself, but I believe they're out there. If these rock apes are here in Vietnam, well, I'm more than sure we definitely have Bigfoot and Sasquatch here at home. After that night, we ended up moving the next day towards our next destination, coordinates that took us an extra seven miles away. I and my team and my officer never dealt with any more rock apes for the time and remainder of my deployment in Vietnam. And, like most things you hear, I saw a lot of terror, a lot of violence, a lot of death, and a lot of killing. I never did see any more of those rock apes. I'll tell you what, out of everything I endured, that was hands down one of the top three scariest and disturbing events. Story 3 Sheep Squatch Hey, I just wanted to send you my encounter story. I hope that's okay. Look, 
before I really get into the nitty gritty of this email, the deep details, I've been a listener of your channel for quite some time now. I have heard so many encounter stories, and I feel like mine almost falls into that cliche of my grandparents owned property, kind of like a ranch setting, and we had some mysterious creature come up and start killing our livestock. Well, eventually, my granddad took a few shots at it and drove it away, but this took several times. I know that feels like it's so cliche now, after hearing so many of your encounter stories, but I feel that after hearing enough, it's given me the courage to come forward and share mine publicly. Since it sounds like you read most people's stories, fingers crossed you'll give mine a chance. Because, I'll be honest, without your channel, I would have never sat down and decided to get this out there. While many people want a reality check from you to know that it happened, I don't need that. But what I would like to know, since you seem to know what cryptids are, what exactly was this creature that killed, stalked, and hunted the animals on my grandparents' property? Before I actually tell my story, I'm going to come right out and say that judging by the pictures I find online on the internet, there's one that really sticks out to me. I don't want to say what we encountered was a sheep squatch because that word just seems so silly. But as far as the physical descriptions and attributions, this creature looked very similar. If you want to know what picture I'm talking about, I guess I should have included it in with you, but oh well. You can find it on a quick Google search. Simply look up Sheep Squatch, and it's the one picture with the black background, and this monstrous sheep-looking creature. That's very similar to what we saw. You have to remember this was in the early to mid-1990s. This sort of artwork or depictions did not exist, so we just thought we were seeing some large woolly monster. We had no idea. And now that we have the internet and things like Google, it has made things clearly. So I might just say that this was indeed a sheep squatch, but I don't mean to be cocky or arrogant. I'll let you be the one to decide that. Okay, enough fluff. Let me finally tell you my story. Sorry for the long intro. This was all back in the early to mid 1990s, taking place in Boone County, West Virginia, which as a matter of fact, turns out that after researching, that's exactly where a majority or a surge of sightings took place in. Wonderful only further nailing the coffin in my conclusion that what I saw is indeed what this thing was. My grandparents owned a considerable amount of acreage. They were pretty typical. They had horses, they had goats, they had cats and dogs. My grandmother was an animal lover, so any chance she could get to rescue a stray, she was there. Same with cats. And the cats were nice because it kept a lot of the mice away, since there were large fields all around their property, and on the far back side were deep, thick woods that my grandfather, every fall and spring, would go hunting for deer, and turkey as well. Sometimes, I remember being a kid, we would see some huge toms on the front end of the property. You betcha that some of those years, I remember how good Thanksgiving dinner was, but beside the point, I was pretty much raised there. I spent a lot of time over at my grandparents' house from the time I was a young boy till I was roughly 16, and both of them passed away of a sudden illness. I'm now 37. So the majority of all these events took place from me being the age of 8 to about 12 or 13. I would often play out in the fields as much as I could. I loved my grandparents' property. There was so much fun. So many things to go and do and explore. The woods on the side being thick with pine, oak, and cedar trees made for many fun games of hide and seek, exploring, pretending to build forts, you name it. It was pretty much a dream childhood place to play. My grandparents were also very involved, especially when I was very, very young. 
and I helped out a lot. Feed the horses, take care of the livestock, even help my grandmother rescue some cats. But as years went on, and I would spend more and more time over there, they would make mention some time of how some animals just seemed to disappear. At that age, and being so young and naive, you kind of just don't really understand the ramifications of an animal just suddenly running away or disappearing. Well, it wasn't until I got older that I understood what they meant by running away. Because this being had been feasting on the livestock for quite some time. My grandparents purposefully kept me in ignorance for my own protection and sanity, which I can't blame them. The first time I would ever see this thing was one night when I think I was closer to 10 years old. I was in the guest bedroom, and I woke in the middle of the night to the sound of gunfire. It kind of shook me, so I kind of popped up out of bed, walked towards the window, and that is when I saw the scene. My grandfather shooting at this large, what I thought was a big white woolly bear, until it stood up and turned its body toward him. I remember it vividly. I gasped and nearly fell back from the sight. It looked like at that age, some big hairy woolly horned monster. Long gangly claws and teeth. It was awful. And you know, the first memory I have of this thing, I don't know if you've ever seen that Christmas movie, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, which I'm sure you have, I mean, who hasn't seen it? Well, get this. There's a creature in that movie called the Bumble, which is supposed to be like the abominable snowman, right? And it has these large, sharp teeth. That's almost exactly what this thing looked like. Long, stringy, gangly white hair, just like that thing. And huge, long, sharp teeth. Again, just like that thing. This thing's face was different, though more elongated, and had big, burly ram-like horns, and it was built like a basketball player. Very tall, very lean, but its chest was very, very broad. The only words I could really use to sum it up, this thing was a monster. I don't really remember if I cried or what, but I was in shock at my grandfather shooting at this creature. I think it eventually turned and went away, but I don't remember. I just remember the gunfire and him shooting at this thing. I think I was able to crawl back in bed and somehow close my eyes and sleep. I don't really remember that part. The next morning, I definitely remember having a conversation with my grandmother. I asked her, what was that monster grandpa was shooting at last night? I'll never forget it. It's like it was yesterday. I was sitting at the kitchen table and she was doing kitchen dishes while I asked. She stopped, wiped her hands off from the cloth, turned to me and said, Sweetheart, there's things in this world we're not meant to know or understand. Now, finish your breakfast. And that was all I really got out of it. Being at such a young age, I didn't press it more, but... I knew this thing was there. After that, I felt really hesitant to go out and play like I had been, to do any sort of exploring like I should have. I just had a feeling this thing would be out there, waiting and watching for the right time to strike. After that, the time would go on, and more and more of the livestock would just drop like flies. Sometimes we'd have several horses go missing, just virtually disappear overnight. Other times it would be goats. Other times, my grandparents' entire pen of chickens nearly went missing. The only thing that was left was blood and feathers. And I could tell my grandfather's attitude was becoming very bitter. He was done. This all amassed to one violent evening when my grandmother kept me inside. She kept telling me, Honey, I don't want you outside. Grandpa's working on something. You need to stay inside. But 
I have found ways to watch from the upper story window. The grandfather had invited several friends, additional men who had come, dressed in full camouflage with large rifles. It appeared as if he were giving them direction, and he also appeared to be shouting, pointing back towards the wood line. They were all looking that direction. And then, after what appeared to be more conversation, in unison, they all moved back there, like a single file trained militant unit. They disappeared into the trees, and that was that. I ran back downstairs and told grandmother. She just says, yeah, they're taking care of some issues. For whatever reason, my grandmother knew about this thing, but she would never acknowledge it, even if you asked her up front, or even knew yourself. It's like she could not face reality, no matter how much she had to be confronted with it. I think at that age, I must have got distracted by the TV. And we hear a string of gunshots go off, followed by yelling and running. Then, my grandmother pokes her head out of the kitchen, looking very concerned, and I'm curious now too, looking up towards the door, where I hear all this shouting, commotion, and running. The door swings open. My grandfather and three of the men come running in. They slam the door shut, lock it, commanding us, looking scared more scared than I've ever seen these men, ever, telling us to lock the doors, close the windows, and go hide down in the cellar. My grandmother, without asking a question, runs over, grabs me, and kind of but forcefully escorts me down into the cellar, locking the door behind her. Grandmother, what's going on? Is it because of that big monster outside? She would not acknowledge my questions. She kept just saying, this is to keep us safe. We're going to be safe. But I was like 10 or 11 at this point. I wasn't just a little boy. I was more than old enough to be aware of this thing out there. I just heard more rustling, yelling, and what sounded like panicked, rushed talking from my grandfather and these three men. And two of the men that originally started out with my grandfather were also not there. I'm not sure what had happened. Within minutes... We hear this awful roar, and then this stomping sound, as this thing was approaching the house. You could hear its weight coming and moving. It sounded very big. That's when you could hear more gunshots. My grandfather and several of these men actually went outside and started shooting at this thing, driving it back into the woodline. Things then go quiet for a short amount of time, and being my age, I'm crying, holding on to my grandmother. I have no idea what's going on. And I just kept asking my grandmother, is that monster going to get us? She just kept saying, no, no, we're going to be okay. Your grandpappy's taking care of it all. After a while, all noises had gone quiet and the door opens up above the cellar. It was my grandfather. He said, I want you two to come out here now. Well, we come to the top of the stairs, and he looks at my grandfather and says, Listen, it's not safe here. Go take him and go stay at the hotel for the night. My grandfather then looked at me, very stern, but I could tell he was panicked. He was so white. I had never seen my grandfather that scared. He just told me one thing. You'll be okay. My grandmother rushed us out of the house, into the car, and quickly down the driveway. That night, or I should say for the next few nights, we stayed at a motel with very limited contact with the house of my grandfather. I kept asking my grandmother, when are we going back? What's wrong with grandpa? Is he okay? And again, she wouldn't answer my questions. At day three or four, I don't remember exactly. We left to go back. But upon our return, the majority of the livestock we had was gone. That included cats, dogs, goats, horses, and their entirety of chickens and roosters. Gone. And not just gone, but a bloody, pulpy mess. 
skeletons half torn apart, still flesh on them, maggots pouring out. Something had just ripped these animals up and left them, like putting an animal through a meat shredder or something. I saw it all. At that tender young age, it traumatized me. It really did. After this event, my grandparents began acting really strange. I can tell this event changed them, especially my grandfather. Then I learned that two of the men that my grandfather helped enlist to take care of business had perished fighting against this thing out in the backwoods. And slowly but surely, my time spent there became less and less and less. A move heavily pushed by my grandparents to preserve my safety as their grandson. As I got to about 1415, we barely even went there anymore. And the times we did, it always involved my grandparents pulling my mother over, speaking to her in private, talking worried, looking over at me, back in the woods, and then back to themselves. Something was still going on. I never found out what it was. Then, as I hit 16, they both died, suddenly. Not on the same day, but within about four months of each other. My mom did not want the property, did not want to deal with the responsibility of all the animals, and upkeep was her so-called reasoning. But I think there was something far more to it. Something she did not want me to know about. She too kept it from me for a long time, until she passed away right before I turned 27, in a car crash. I apologize for my story being so long, but I wanted to make sure to get every detail I could. And I also want to put in some addendums to the story. I'm not going to name the two men that had gone missing, but I was told they were killed by that creature. Police had come and investigated and taped off the entire section of that property while we were at the motel. When I came back, I guess there was still a pretty thorough investigation being done, but I don't really remember that. But being at that age and that time, I was not going back there and I wasn't spending a lot of time looking. A lot of my time was spent locked inside where I understood that I was most safe. My grandfather was even under investigation for well over a year because of these two men disappearing. I mean, you can't exactly tell police. Yeah, a large hairy monster killed them. That's an open invitation for foul play. While my grandparents were never charged with anything, I believe they were still under the watchful eye of the law, as well as this being that resided in the far back side of our property in Boone County. This is where everything ties in. If you see, if you research the concept of a sheep squash, which is just a large, woolly, ram-looking cryptid, the other known sightings of this thing all occurred in the same Boone County, West Virginia, which means it is very plausible that that is what me and my grandparents dealt with for this time period. I can't say for sure, but if you look at the time period and the area, everything lines up perfect. The other major sightings of this thing also occurred in the mid-90s, right around the same time frame as our sighting. I have no idea if there's anything of this property now, who owns it, and if this thing is still sighted there. I have no desire to go back and check. And besides, I've moved across the country anyway. But, in a way, I feel like what happened to me is a part of my life now. I have to honor and respect that and accept that. Thank you, What Lurks Beneath, for allowing me to write this to you and just get this off my chest so I could share with others like you. Thank you so much. Story 4 Vampires and Chupacabras Hello, I am reaching out to you because I am what I would like to call an amateur paranormal researcher. I don't get the chance now with 2020 
and everything happening to get out and do much field work like I used to. But it's still a hobby I very much enjoy. I feel like I would take some time today, sit down, and write to you some bits and pieces of information, research, and stories that I have accumulated to share with you. I find these all very interesting and very credible witnesses. I don't know if you remember me, but I actually wrote to you well over a year ago, sharing you some of the same encounters before, or same types of encounters. I apologize about not being able to write to you since, but you know how life is sometimes. The first topic that I wanted to cover and talk about with you are vampires. No, not the Hollywood kind of vampires, like Dracula, or the ones that suck blood. I'm talking from a paranormal cryptozoology realm. There are beings, not like Dracula, again, but vampiric cryptids, different than chupacabras. These are pale humanoid beings, mouth full of teeth, large fangs, dull red eyes, and they go around drinking the blood of livestock and other animals they find. And yes, even humans. There's been several documented cases, but I promise, even if you do some digging, you probably won't find much. People in the up above keep that stuff pretty well covered up, if you know what I'm talking about. The only reason I have this information is because I know a few people. I don't want to mention names or positions, but I get some stories fed to me that'll make your heart stop. One off the top of my mind was this young woman who had rented a small single-wide trailer out in the country in the outskirts of Atlanta, Georgia. Some strange being entered and forced its way into her home. When they found her body, her corpse was completely drained of blood. She lived alone, apparently, and worked as a full-time EMT. Upon inspection of her wounds, she was not attacked with any visible weapon, but only left with large marks along her neck and body, like something had punctured parts of her body and drained all the blood out. Other than that, she was completely unharmed. No scratch, no fractures, no even sense of struggle of fighting. It's like something came in, took her by surprise, and, well, had their way. This and the chupacabra also bleed into the same realm. For example, in eastern Texas, I was speaking to a gentleman last year in the early springtime. Several of his horses, he was finding them dead on his property, out by the back side where his property ends and the tree line began. They too had multiple sets of puncture wounds all over the body. Not just your standard two puncture wounds on the neck, you know, like most people get with a vampire. These were two sets of puncture wounds, some on the neck, meaning more than one set, and other sets of puncture wounds all along the body, with the ultimate purpose being to drain blood. These puncture wounds, just like the woman found in the single white trailer outside of Atlanta, Georgia, ran very deep, more than just an inch. The wounds were also clean of any blood, which is very strange. No dried blood being found at all and they were not made from any sort of tool or surgical device. There was some sort of puncture. The question here is what? There's another gentleman, very nice guy. I'll call him Rick. Obviously not his real name, but he wanted to remain anonymous. He lived out in eastern Oklahoma, and he says that he's experiencing very similar things because I've had a chance to sit down with him over the phone and express almost similar sightings and experiences. He says he's seen this thing himself, and that it's this Nosferatu-looking thing, is how he described it, since he was such a fan of vampire horror movies when he was just a boy. That's how he recognized what it was, said it looked very much like Nosferatu, but did not look as human as Nosferatu did is how he described it, but it was very pale, had long fingers, a very slender head, and long body. 
it appeared to be naked and all white. It really just makes you wonder, what is out there? And what are these things? Why are they coming into our land and doing this? Where are they hiding? Where are they coming from? A wonderful young couple that I know who live down in western Texas, bordering New Mexico, have their hands full with a series of dead livestock. All of them, the blood being drained. And being of Latino descent, they're no stranger to the Chupacabra, and they fully believe that that is what they are dealing with. They say that this being has been on an upswing in behavior and aggression in the last year or two. Like the shutdown has driven it mad and has caused it to go into full force. Like something bigger is controlling it. And this isn't just me saying those things. This is them. Now, I took those dots and connected it with yet another middle-aged woman in Northern California who... I'll keep anonymous again because she did not want to be named. But she said I could say this. She plans on running for a spot in local government. One night, she was out walking her dog. This was during the pandemic. And she seen this bright white light flash. But not just flash in the sky. The flash went down to the ground. Shortly thereafter, she began seeing strange shadows just outside of her house. And then... As she was making her way back to her porch, she saw some strange creature watching her. She described the creature as having pointy red eyes, a mouth full of sharp teeth, and very ugly looking. Kind of like some sort of goblin is how she made it seem. Reminiscent of that of the creatures in Lord of the Rings. That was her description. Very interesting when you pair her story side by side with Rick, the gentleman in Oklahoma. Were they seeing a similar being? Perhaps the same one. Perhaps even the same beings that killed the young girl in Atlanta. I'll send you a secondary email here soon. I have a lot more encounters and stories I'll share with you. But for now, I'll end this. I don't want it to turn into a mini book. So for now, I'll sign off. But expect to hear from me very soon. Story 5. The Jersey Devil I remember this like it was yesterday. I was hiking back with my dog Duke and the Pine Barrens back in the year 2000. It was a very cold, wet November day. I was on my way back from a college class here in New Jersey. The Pine Barrens, located and nestled in southern New Jersey, are one of the most spookiest in most beautiful places on earth, in my humble opinion. The Pine Barrens are also the largest protected wilderness area in the entirety of the state of New Jersey. Not saying a lot, considering how small the state is. It makes for a wonderful place to go hiking or camping. In fact, I've been hiking in the Pine Barrens for as long as I can remember. I think that's why this specific sighting did such a number on my psyche. I've always been fascinated by nature, beauty, and wildlife, specifically here in the Barrens, and I'm a huge fan of hiking and being outdoors in general. I decided to go for a hike this day, as I had already stated, when I was out of a long day of class. I was a sophomore in college at the time, and only 18. I was fortunate enough to graduate high school at 16 due to my good performance. And even with the cold, wet New Jersey weather, that was not going to stop me from this beautiful hike I was taking with my dog. I always preferred to hike solo, too. There's just something about the peace and quiet of a solo mission. But I wasn't completely solo. I had my dog, Duke, a German shepherd who might had had for a while accompanying me on this trip. I could not be more relaxed when I was around him. He was the best dog on earth. Very loyal, high energy, very protective. He was my hiking buddy for the longest time, until he died back in 2007. Luckily, this was when he was still alive. He craved and loved adventuring as much as I. So, 
and Duke and I were walking down a road in the Pine Barrens. We both suddenly responded to a loud metal bang. We thought that was odd, considering there was no sheet metal or anything that could make or produce such a noise within eye shot. I mean, we're out here in the woods. But it stopped both of us in our tracks, and we looked around. The noise did not seem to come from one direction, but more omnidirectional, all around us, in the sky, beneath us, beside us. We were both very high alert, both very on guard, and had no idea what was making the loud noise. I continued walking, and I heard yet another loud bang. I could not tell where the sound was coming from. Then, the loud bangs turned into a high, pitched screeching noise. And already, Duke was acting very on edge, his fur going up, him kind of growling, and acting very antsy. I would trust a dog's sixth sense more than a human's. They could sense things that we as people cannot. So when a dog starts acting up, you know something is going on. I just continued walking, with Duke staying close by my side. After and have been hiking in the Pine Barrens for as long as I have, I have never heard a sound like this before, and I have heard all sorts of noises and animals, but this was different. So I continued walking down the trail, and this strange screeching noise turned into this eruption of noise directly ahead. Out came out of the trees this massive black shape. At first, I kid you not, I thought it was a pegasus for a second, which is a large horse with wings, except that's not what it was. This thing was all black, had a large goat or horse-shaped head, I guess you can call it, and the wings weren't like that of an eagle or a bird's. They were scraggly like a bat, and it had large talons and red eyes. It kind of just flew through, not really in our direction, but it was massive. It seemed to erupt out of a part of the trees, and then quickly, after a couple of seconds, disappear in a different section of trees. We just happened to see it. It paid no attention to us. Unfortunately, I don't think it saw us. My dog was losing it, whining and crying, something Duke has never done, or never did. That was more than enough for Duke and I. I took that as a sign to turn around and walk away. When I saw this thing, I wasn't immediately to the conclusion that, yep, Jersey Devil exists, I knew it. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what we saw. But I felt the feelings even leading up to this sighting of whatever creature I could have been. The feelings of uneasiness, being watched. The feelings like you're not alone out here in the woods. It was disturbing, but I was quick to dismiss them. Then, of course, Duke starts acting up, and then this sighting happened. Who knows? Maybe it was an alien. I don't know. But I have had the chance to tell my story to several people in the last 20 years. I'm told over and over again, sounds like I had my own run-in with the Jersey Devil. What do you think? Story 6. The Lake Monster Back in 2004, I was fishing on a lake with my father, here in northern Illinois. We were fishing for yellow pike. We were out in the middle of the lake. The weather was beautiful, sunny. We had been there for maybe about an hour and a half, when something in the water caught my attention. At first, I thought it could have been a fish, but I looked to my right where I saw the movement in the water, and I kid you not, I see the sighting of a very strange creature. About 150 yards out from us, this thing began swimming toward us. It was very long, much longer than any yellow pike I'd ever seen, and it had a long neck. The closer it got, the more prehistoric it looked. It never fully came above the surface of the water, but it stayed right underneath, allowing me to get a pretty decent visual at it, especially 
as it came close to the boat. I was never a believer of the whole Loch Ness monster thing, but I kid you not, as this thing neared within 20-30 yards of the boat, it looked like a small plesiosaur, and then it submerged and dove deeper in the water, and it was gone. It was like it was skimming the surface. My dad, who was completely oblivious, I explained to him what I had just seen. He really blew me off. It was probably a sturgeon. I explained to him, Dad, I know what sturgeon looked like. This looked nothing like a fish or sturgeon I'd ever seen. He didn't believe me. The day continued and we never saw anything else. After about 10 more minutes, we moved our boat to a different fishing spot. And then, as the day came to evening, we headed back to shore. I tried telling my dad more about it, how I saw that it had what I would estimate about a five foot long neck attached to a large round body. I couldn't really make out any details of the head, just that it had a large body and a long neck and was swimming toward us underneath the water. And I reiterated that, estimated of course, it came within around 30 yards from the boat, then descending down. Whatever it was, I'm sure was not a full grown adult yet. And you think about all the things they find in lakes, especially bigger ones. There's always that possibility after all. I mean, we don't know anything about underground caverns of lakes or rivers or any of them how they connect underground. There might be more there than we think. I'm sorry my encounter is so short, but I at least hope you find use of it. Story 7. Thunderbird You may not believe my encounter, but I figured I would at least try and share it with somebody who was open. Before I wrote this and sent it to you, I saw that on your channel you had a few other Thunderbird encounter stories that you had reported. I figure since nobody else had been talking about these cryptid beings, this might be the person I could finally share my encounter story with. Hopefully, somebody won't think I'm crazy. This was back in 2010. I was driving with my brother. We were in Montana. It was in the evening time, and I had just picked my brother up from work. He didn't have a car at this time. I think he was having car issues, if I remember right. And so, this short period of time, I would be picking him up from work in the evening and taking him back home. The weather was clear, and there was still light in the sky, so there was no possibility of a misidentification or any obstruction in visibility of our sighting. We were busy driving up a small rocky hill, paying attention to the road and just lost in our surroundings. We see this large shape in the sky, pretty high up. My brother actually noticed it first, and it appeared to be a large bird, but it was so high up, you couldn't really make anything out other than the fact that it was a bird. Well, we noticed it was descending from the sky and becoming very large. That's when we noticed just how large this bird was. It was all black in color, like a raven, and it was flying at an incredible speed. It swooped down more and more, and we were shocked at how big this bird was. Massive. Nearly as big as my small pickup truck. And it's not coming directly at us, but more in our direction. And it's descending, like it's coming towards something. We're both kind of like in awe, freaking out seeing this huge bird. And as it swoops down, we watch. As it grabs hold of this full-grown cattle, with two massive talons, grabs it by the back, picks it up, and carries it off. Much the same way an eagle would as it catches salmon out of the river and casually flies off. This bird grabbed hold of this cow and just casually flew off. We were shocked and amazed, not believing what we had just seen. We looked around and there was nobody else on the road. There was nothing around, only cattle and lots of rocks and trees. We were in total shock and amazement at the sight before us. We kept trying to follow it up in the sky, looking back to where it was going. 
We couldn't really tell the direction it was headed, but saw it was going somewhere. It was flying in a different direction than the direction it came in. Then, we lost sight of it. We drove for about another hour before I was able to drop my brother off. We talked about this the entire way home. And to this day, sometimes my brother and I still bring this up. Do you remember that time we saw a Thunderbird? That's the only thing I could think of. It also appeared to have a little bit of white going down its chest to its stomach. Easily a god-like bird. Completely massive. I couldn't recall any details about the face or the beak structure. Nothing specific. Just that it was incredibly oversized. And that thought alone always sticks out in my head. Sometimes I wonder, had my brother not been there with me, would I have even seen it? Maybe not. Had I been on a different spot on the road? Possibly not. This bird, I need you to understand, was of incredible size. I can't exaggerate that enough. And sometimes, I question my own brain. The authenticity of my own eyes. Did I see something real? And then I have to realize, yeah, well, my brother saw it too. There's no way it could have just been imagined by both of us. I don't think that happens. And I guess out here in this country, a bird of that size could be hiding anywhere. You just never know. There's more land than people, especially up here. I wouldn't be surprised. And I have heard of native stories speaking about the legends of things in the likes of Thunderbird. Large godlike birds that would abduct humans, children, and cattle and deer and take them off for food. These were birds easily seven to eight feet tall, with a wingspan I couldn't even imagine. Anyway, believe me if you want, I know what I saw was real. There's no mistaking it. I know for a fact, Thunderbirds do exist. Story 8. The Goat Man So, this story starts off with a group of my friends at a party that we had showed up late to. It seems that most scary stories always seem to have alcohol involved. We showed up, and it was already bunk. Everybody had been drinking for the last few hours. We stayed, we BS'd for about a half an hour. We drank enough shots to catch a decent. We drank enough shots to catch a decent of enough buzz. Now it was about one in the morning, and everybody was having a great time. Out of the blue, the tribal cops just had to ruin the party, like every good cop does. I also forget to mention, I live on the res, and there really is not a lot of streetlights. Houses are very close together, so there's really not much light coming off of them either. A lot of parents don't like to let their kids out of dark. It's because there are a lot of dark things that come out. There are stories of Goatman running behind cars, chasing people at night, even people getting abducted in some cases. The res I'm situated on has a lot of small hills and grasslands, also plains. It's very hard to say, but after we looked at each other, we knew we had to run out the back door and into the fields. My two friends were a little slower than I, so I took the easy way, running down the hill to that little pond. A lot of people call it Kid's Pond. As I looked around, I have friends who were about a hundred yards away from me, running over the hill. I was by myself, waiting for the cops to leave, and the house we just ran from. I can see everything from where I am, and right now. I must have been 75 yards away from the road, with three lonely houses in my view at that moment. All the other ones were very far. About 15 minutes went by when I heard faint sounds coming way behind me. In that second, I thought to myself, there my friends are. Three seconds had passed. It now sounds like horse hooves running at top speed behind me, catching up at a rate 
I can't even explain. At that moment, I knew. It was a goat man. My heart dropped. Fear and adrenaline kicked me into something only you get when you're getting your shot or about to die. I sprinted straight forward into the house that was closest to me. Now, I'm hyperventilating. In my sprint, tripping, rolling over weeds and bigger rocks, thinking I'm about to die. I'm getting really close to the road, still hearing those horrible hooves. All of a sudden, I'm stopped dead in my tracks, 15 feet from the road. I was clotheslined by a barbed wire fence from the waist down. I felt nothing, turned my head around to see or hear anything. I just stared into the dark fields, looking for any horse or glowing eyes, my friends. Anything to explain what I had just experienced. Nothing. I calmed down for a few seconds, lifted up my shirt to find several gashes. I only needed a few stitches. I hopped over the fence, walked back to the house, not giving a darn about cops. They were now gone, and my friends also showed up as soon as I did. I asked why they ditched me. They said, bro, you ditched us. Why are you bleeding? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. The next day came. I thought about where I was at the time and when it decided to stop chasing me. I noticed that it stopped right when I ran into that wired fence. I really could just picture Goatman laughing at me, running into that fence, I have to admit. I was really close to the streetlight. That light probably saved my life. Story 9. Goblins so, I was hiking alone in the woods one day. It was set out to be a fairly long hike, about five or so miles, and I began at about five in the morning. My goal was to get in there, finish up, and be home by the afternoon. It was now 10 a.m., and I was almost done, the morning sun already rising high in the sky. I was looking at my map when I began thinking to myself, I'm almost done. That went by quick, and I heard a sound coming from my right. When I look to see what it was, I see this tall little creature that was maybe four feet tall. It was indeed a goblin. I mean, judging by its appearance, I had no other conclusions to come to. It had short legs, small ears, and kind of pointed features. It was also kind of a dull red color. It appeared to be naked and was watching me from behind a tree. A very dull black eyes set in its skull. As soon as it saw that I saw it, it almost kind of made a different expression, like it was frightened and ran off. I never saw it again, but I've seen it once and that's all I need. It scared me and shocked me, so I got out of there quick made it back towards the end of the trail, and made it home. I never in my wildest dreams would have ever imagined such things like a goblin even exists. I had no idea. I'd been going on that same trail loop for years now, and I'm pretty sure out of all the times I've ever been hiking or been out in the woods, I can never imagine such a creature existing. Even the thought alone of it is ludicrous, honestly. I know this encounter is very long, but I want you to know these things are out there, and I hope your audience understands that. Story 10. The Mogolin Monster When my fiancé was younger and stupid, he says he had a few things happen to him. This is not my story, but it is his, and I will tell it in his point of view. When I was 21, I decided to go out with a bunch of friends in the woods. We would all go hang out after dark. Now, we all had booze and flashlights. The two of us had guns, and I had my knife on me. The walk was pretty long, just to get to the cliff that had a beautiful scenery 
so we could see the sunset. We were just going to drink and get high. Nothing too major. Just some booze and weed. We got to the spot no problem. At the top of this cliff, there was a huge rock that you could stand behind and nobody would see you. So, we sat on the cliff and our back to the rock, the forest behind the rock. One of my buddies, let's call him Jeff, got up and said he had to take a piss. We told her to be careful as it's getting dark and there are cougars and bears in the woods after all. So he was told to hurry up and be quick in case anything would happen. If something did, just holler. So he goes behind the rock and we could hear him start to do his business. We're all just sitting there, smoking weed and drinking, when all of a sudden, we heard this loud, almost ear-piercing shriek. We thought it was a mountain lion at first, so we go to check on Jeff, and he's standing there, pants down around his ankles, with this bewildered look on his face. He's almost ghost white, and looks like he saw one. We're looking around and we noticed that there's this huge gaping hole in the forest right towards where we could hear something running away. This hole was easily seven or eight feet tall, and about three or four people across. It was huge. There's no way a bear or a cougar could have made a hole like that. And the sounds of the thing running away, it almost sounded like a Bigfoot. In my area, where I live, we had tales of something called the Mogollon Monster, which is basically Bigfoot in a sense, and this creature is seven or eight feet tall, very big. Nobody has ever really gotten a good look at or picture of him. We don't know what happened that night. Jeff refused to talk about it. We don't know what he saw. And in fact, some of us chased after it with guns, but it was much quicker and it got away. We don't know what it was or what happened or what Jeff saw. We can only assume that something else was out there last night that also scared the bejesus out of this big man who, since that night, has refused to ever step foot back in those woods. Story 11. The Succubus Growing up, my family was always usually pretty normal. It was me, my mom, my dad, and my older brother. He was five years older than I. But in high school, he began getting involved with the wrong crowd. I'm not talking about just drugs and alcohol. Although, like any normal American teenager, that had a part to play. But he became a part of a crowd that was into much darker things. I'm talking about specific rituals, Ouija boards, the whole nine yards. Being 13 at the time is probably the first time I ever caught him or discovered him using a Ouija board. This was back in the 80s. I had no idea what a Ouija board was yet. I was so young and ignorant and naive. So I asked him, and he asked me the question, do you believe in ghosts? Of course, I told him yes. And then he asks, do you want to talk to one? I'd asked him, wait, you can actually talk to spirits? Yeah, I do it all the time. This is what would start a long ritual of going in with my brother almost every other few days, playing with a Ouija board, contacting spirits and talking to them. This eventually kick-started my interest in things like occultism, mysticism, and the dark side of the paranormal. However, my brother's interest in the occult and mine were very different. I never followed his crowd, nor did I follow his path. My interest was pretty shallow compared to his. While I thought the subject was interesting, I never did what he did, read books on it, did rituals, fully immersed himself in that lifestyle. The extent of my activity was mainly using the Ouija board with him to talk to spirits. And I can tell you, 
as I got a little older, closer to 15 and he was about to graduate, there were many times I would borrow his Ouija board and talk to spirits myself. There was one in particular who I believe was a female. She always called herself Matilda, which I thought was a very interesting name for a supposed female spirit. And this might be a little TMI for you, but as a 15-year-old boy, let's just say my hormones were raging, and not having a girlfriend can make a boy kind of desperate. During one of my late-night conversations with Matilda over the board, she asked me out of the blue, Would you like me to come visit you in your room tonight? I told her absolutely, having no idea what was going to happen. I just thought I would actually get to physically see a ghost or a spirit manifest. And since I felt comfortable with the already relationship between me and Matilda on a, what I thought was a friend level, I wasn't going to be scared. I put the board away after we ended the conversation, and I think I stayed up that night, digging around until I finally fell asleep completely forgetting about the whole question Matilda had asked me. I awoke sometime in the morning. I say awoke because I'm not really too sure. Sometimes I feel like it's a very lucid dream, but I want to say awoke because it seems like it could have been reality. It's really hard to describe, but what had happened was this beautiful girl maybe 16, 17, maybe 18. She was very young, like some of the girls in my high school, completely naked, climbing on top of me. And, well, I think you can probably guess what happened next. It was the most intense experience my teenage body had ever endured. But that's not what I'm here to write about. While that did happen, what's important is everything that came afterwards. Afterwards, some point, I think I fell back asleep. The next morning, I felt like crap. Not only did I feel like I was hit by a train, completely drained of energy, but I felt empty, like a part of me was missing. Not long after, I started having these severe bouts of depression Anger, anxiety. I never had these things before, while still feeling this empty feeling inside of me. I would start hearing voices, and I would have this unnatural craving for alcohol, which, by the way, being only 15, 16, I never drank, never had an interest in alcohol ever. But now, suddenly, I wanted to party and go crazy, just for the sake of being inebriated. And not even three months after that night, I had a brain aneurysm. Suddenly, managed to survive that, but nearly died. My brother, on the other hand, passed away at the age of 19 in a horrific car accident. During those three months, him and I, who were best friends as brothers, became almost violent enemies. He had told me, though, because not all of our conversations were violent, that he too sometimes would see Matilda late at night, and they too would, well, you know, in his room. But he said that afterwards, he always felt like she took a piece of him, like a piece of his spirit. To make sure he wasn't just BSing me, I asked him to describe what she looked like. His description was nearly identical to mine, a beautiful girl, about 17 or 18, long hair, gorgeous, but something was wrong. Because like me, shortly thereafter, my life, my grades, my family began to spiral downhill. Unlike my brother, he developed a severe heroin addiction shortly thereafter, and then followed and pursued several of these late night encounters with Matilda, which only drove things worse for him. I only had the one, but during this time, 
I never equated that experience with all the things that were going negative in my life. I just assumed it was life throwing me some pretty crazy curveballs, like the aneurysm, for example, and miraculously surviving it. Little did I know that I actually did the dance with a succubus. For a while, I was convinced she had taken a piece of my soul, or all of my soul. After the brain aneurysm, I turned my life around, gave my life to Christ, and burned the board in which my brother had given me. I am really generally not one for paranormal stories, encounters, or ghosts, but I have the most realistic experience, or call it a dream, if you will, of my encounter with a succubus. I know about them now. I know they are real demons disguised as lustful, beautiful women to entrap you into having sex with them so they could take a piece of you, so they can infiltrate your life and destroy you from the inside out. Had I kept having these late night encounters with Matilda, I'm positive I would have ended up just like my brother. Had he not died in a car accident, his life was severely going downhill. He was getting very suicidal among all his other addictions. His heroin one was just the most obvious. Let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to ask away. Story 12. The Yowie. I was working at a cattle station in Central West, New South Wales, Australia, back in the early 1990s. At the time, I was just a 19-year-old kid and had been working on the station for about seven months. I was in charge of a team of about roughly 10 Aboriginal workers who were doing a lot of work on the station. I was working on the station one night. It was about 9.30 when I was called away by one of the workers. He found a kangaroo that had been killed by what appeared to be a blunt force and was near the road. I went to have a look at the dead animal. The way it died was very strange. I was standing at the front of the kangaroo when I heard a noise behind me. Again, this dead kangaroo was just off the road, but there were also no cars around, and it looked freshly killed. So I turned around in response to the noise, and I saw something no other than what I could describe as a yaoi, standing five meters away. It, judging by the blood on its face and the partial pieces of flesh missing off the kangaroo, had been eating on it. It was standing there, looking at me, probably wondering why I was standing between it and its catch. It was roughly three meters tall, big head, sunken in eyes, very defined brow ridge, strong jawline a long nose. It had no hair on its face, at least not much. It was very distinctive. It had this kind of leathery skin on its face and hands, which, in comparison to the rest of its body, were pale, since everything else was dark. I could see that it had very dark hair growing on all over its body and limbs. As you could imagine, I couldn't move. I was frozen to this one spot. I was looking at the yaoi, and it was looking at me. I was terrified. I thought it would probably kill me. I knew it was going to attack me, and I had no idea what I could do about it. It then turned its head to the side and made kind of a clicking, whistling noise, turned back towards me, and then turned its head around towards the kangaroo. Not a second later, I heard a response click off in the brush, not far away. This yaoi wasn't alone. Me and the Aboriginal turned around and ran back to the station, which was maybe 60 meters. As soon as we did, we did not hear this thing behind us. I was so relieved, I could hardly believe what we saw. I was shaking like a leaf. After going back to the station, I told my boss what had happened. He told me that he knew about the yaoi's, 
but had never actually seen one. He assumed and were told they were very dangerous, also very aggressive, and would kill a human if they were hungry enough. I was very lucky to have seen one, and more lucky to have gotten away. When we walked by that part of the road a little later in the night, the kangaroo was gone. I believe the yaoi came back and took its kill. Some extra notes. The aboriginal workers in the station all knew about them, but had never heard or seen them before. I consider myself a tradesman, very analytical, very tactile, and matter of fact. I like to consider myself reliable and honest. I have no reason to make a story like this up. I do not desire clout or recognition in any form. As a matter of fact, I would really prefer you don't use my real name. Before this happening, I had not heard of any actual stories of the Yaoi. Even though I heard of the Yaoi, no one's ever told me an encounter story before, so I wasn't sure what to expect. And part of me didn't believe. As for the encounter itself, I'm surprised the Yaoi was not aggressive towards me. Had I clearly been blocking its way towards its kill, maybe it was calling in a friend to come deal with the issue, and I ran in time before I could do anything. Even its demeanor wasn't violent. I think it was more shocked to see me as I it. That's how I got out of it. If there's anything to take away from my story, be careful in Australia, and even be more careful if you're in the outback. Story 13 Mountain Giants I have been in the military for roughly the majority of my life, but I'm retired now. For six of the main years I was in, I served in the Marine Corps and another four as an Army combat medic. I have done three separate tours in Afghanistan and was a part of a special airborne division and one tour in Iraq with special operations units. I was a part of a security detail in Afghanistan. We were patrolling a village, looking for terrorists. After a long day, we were headed back to base when we came to an edge of the cliff. By the way, this whole thing took place up the Afghanistan mountains. This cliff was a line that overlooked our camp and the valley beyond it. We were looking down at the valley below, and I joke not, we seen a massive figure coming down the valley. I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want to startle the guys, so I stayed quiet. The figure eventually walked out of the edge of the cliff and into the sun. It was a giant, red hair, six toes, and was wielding a massive what looked like a stone makeshift axe. He must have been at least 13 to 15 feet tall, just a gargantuan being. I was in shock at what I was seeing. Clearly, this isn't a science fiction movie. This is reality. How can this exist? But trying to hide it didn't do any good. Several of my team saw it as well, all pointing in disbelief. We couldn't make out any super specific details, like features of the eyes and such, but it was close enough that we could see that it had six toes and that it was full of red hair. This thing was definitely humanoid. We watched him for a while, and fortunately, this thing never looked up at us. After a little while, it walked back into the cover of the valley, and I think down into the mouth of a large cavern. We were all in disbelief. After a few minutes, we continued on with our patrol. The following day, we were headed back to patrol when our commander stopped us. We were to stay in the base. We were not to go out on our scheduled patrols for the day. Then, about 30 minutes goes by, and we overheard on the radio that an unidentified group of giant humanoids were attacking the outposts in the valley. Our camp wasn't being attacked, so we weren't exactly sure what was going on. 
we couldn't see anything from the camp because of the mountains that were in the way. While we were sitting there, we just knew we could tell something was up. Later on that evening, we saw another two of these giant humanoids walking around the base, but farther away. They looked to be very similar to the one we saw the previous day. Red hair, very large, carrying these strange makeshift weapons, very crude and made to be out of stone and wood. They were walking away, so we only saw their backside. I normally don't share this kind of information with anybody, because in this day and age, if you even so much as speak about Bigfoot, people think you're a wackadoodle, let alone giants that you saw in Afghanistan on tour. Either way, believe me or not, I don't care. I encourage you though to do some research, because I am not the only soldier to have seen these things. I know there are more of us out there who have decided to open up and keep our anonymity. Do some research. Story 14. The Fae. My name is Tom. I wanted to share a story with you. I have kept to myself for many years. In all this time, it's been both a haunting memory and in some ways, oddly, a pleasant one. I live in Alabama, but my family's roots run deep in Ireland. My grandparents have been telling me stories about the Fae of Celtic legend since I was five. Leprechauns, changelings, fairies, and the subject of this story, the Banshee. I always took my grandparents at their word, assuming the legends to be true up until my teenage years when I began to quote-unquote grow up, or so I thought. As I'm sure you've guessed by now, there came a time when I was forced to see that I was wrong. The night before my high school graduation, my grandfather died of a heart attack. I had to open my eyes to the legends once again. And that very night, I became a believer. And needless to say, I didn't make it to my graduation ceremony, opting to stay with my grandmother and keep her company. She was broken. At about two in the morning, five hours after my grandfather had died, I decided to sneak out to the front porch of my grandfather's rural home for a quick cigarette while everybody else was sound asleep. It happened about five hours after my grandfather passed. I had decided to stay with my family so I could help console my now widowed grandmother. It was about two in the morning when I decided to sneak a cigarette. The night was cold and dimly lit by a full moon. After my first drag, the gravity of the situation hit me and I lost it. I began crying. Tears streamed down my face as I contemplated life without the man I grew up loving. All the memories came flooding in like a tidal wave, crashing at the shores of my mind. It took me a while to cool down, but eventually I collected myself. Just as the feeling of flushed out emotional energy began to wash over me, I heard the most bone chilling scream I have ever heard in my life. My head darted frantically straining to find something to pick out in the low light. My eyes catching a splotch of paleness not far away from the house. It was a long, flowing white dress. As I scanned upward, analyzing the unexpected figure, I could see strands of long black hair dancing in the wind, obscuring the mysterious face of a woman. One word came to the forefront of my mind as I desperately searched for an explanation. As I stared on, I noticed another figure standing next to the woman. After my eyes focusing in on it, I could see clearly that it was my grandfather. He was right there, just a mere meters away from me. 
five hours after he was taken by the ambulance to leave his final wishes carried out. He gazed longingly toward the house, while the woman stared away into the distance. I watched them, petrified for what seemed like an eternity, before the banshee suddenly turned her head to lock eyes with me. My heart seemed to stop as the details of her legend came back to me. The banshee was said to be something like an angel of death, appearing to signify the death of somebody. As some say, she appears to take lives. A few seconds later, she unleashed another unearthly scream as my grandfather raised his hand to bid me farewell one last time. The two vanished before my eyes, leaving me alone in the darkness. After that night, the way I saw the things was forever altered. I realized that the world we think we know is far too strange to make any hard claims. This event began what I strongly feel will be a trend in my life. I have this inkling that my future holds many more bizarre encounters. I've had a few more already. Story 15 The Wendigo So, this happened a couple of minutes ago. I'm very skeptical, as when I read horror stuff, my mind will go into overdrive and try to see and hear these kind of things right after. Anyway, I just finished reading that trilogy somebody posted. Then, I began playing a video game. For the reference, I have two desks. They're side by side. One on the left, closest to my window, which has my computer on it. So, in other words, I was right beside the window. Now, it's summer here in Canada, and despite all the jokes about our freezing winters, it's actually quite warm right now. So, I had my window open. Anyway, I'm sitting beside my window playing a strategy game and suddenly I hear this kind of wet hiss like a cat hissing but through a straw but also a little bit of a mix of a human gargle in it. I don't really know how to explain it. Like imagine if you were to hiss but it caught on spit at the back of your throat and merged the two sounds together. Moving on I attempted to close my window. Now, it locks into place while open pretty easily, so it normally won't let me drop it down. I gave it a yank. Nothing. That was to be expected. But what I did not expect was the next two yanks that did not do anything. Finally, it came down, but the hiss was still there, and... Since I'm not some priest from the exorcist or something, I immediately pulled down my blackout curtain in case there was anything out there maybe looking in. I turned all sounds off in my room and just sat there silently for a little while, just in case to keep me safe, like maybe there was a presence there. Now again, I'm in Canada, so I know that it would be a Wendigo or whatever not a skinwalker, but I just felt that it would be a good idea to write this down and kind of vent to try and calm down a bit. What do you think? Story 16 Dog Man I was taking my dog for a walk on a pretty well-maintained dirt road here in the back forests of Washington State. This was back in February, so by this time, it was dark and cold. It was 6.30 p.m., and I let my dog off its leash. We were walking along, and my dog goes and runs off in the bramble. That's when I immediately hear my dog start whimpering and barking. I turn around, and there's what I can see a large shape further back in the bushes, which is what my dog is barking at. Now, the reason I'm not certain of what the shape is is because it was already dark outside, but there was movement, so I could tell there was something there, 
and it wasn't a person, judging by the size and shape, but the growth around it, or it being wintertime, the lack of growth, obstructed any full view I had of it. My dog starts whimpering and backing up. So, as my dog is coming up back to me, this thing steps out. This huge dog. It was like a fully grown black German Shepherd walking on its hind legs. It had hawks just like a dog, a legs and body just like a dog, except it was easily three times the size, completely massive. Its arms were much longer, more masculine, and kind of had hands more like that of a raccoon. This thing steps out and stares at both of us. My dog's still barking, going crazy, and here I am, completely flabbergasted and overtaken with fear. I'm not even exactly sure how to react to this thing. As this thing gets closer, I can hear it breathing, although it was a very strange noise. It was breathing in like these short bursts of breath, very heavily. So I'm trying to get my dog to come back, but the dog is being drawn closer to this thing, and my dog is still whimpering, going crazy, barking. This thing kind of crouches down, grabs hold of my dog, and in one swift motion, picks up my dog, grabs its hand around its neck, and twists it, like it was twisting some soaked t-shirt to rinse out the water. Crack. My dog's neck is broken, and without even hesitating for a second, takes a large bite out of the spine, and the ripping and tearing that wet flesh noise is still forever ingrained in my mind. But this creature acted like this was business as usual, no big deal, as if my dog, my barking whimpering dog, was just a free meal ticket for it, food on a silver platter. I turned and I ran, having gone from 15 feet away from this creature completely frozen and terrified. I was running as fast as I could away from this thing. I wasn't exactly sure what it is I encountered or what killed my small dog, other than some large direwolf freak looking dog. I ran and it never followed me home. As soon as I came back inside, I called the police immediately and told them some large dog just killed and ate my dog. Police show up, they take my statement, but more than likely, they claim I probably saw a black bear that had gotten far too aggressive because maybe cubs were around. I argued with the officer for a good 10 minutes, telling him that this was a large dog and no black bear. He didn't buy it, and told me large dogs like that don't exist, and they certainly don't behave like that, aka walking on their hind legs so comfortably. There's really not much else to my story. I feel it'd be completely, totally childish to sit here and say, I saw a werewolf. That's not exactly what this was, but it sure as hell was the most humanistic, realistic creature I've ever seen. Story 17 The Flesh Gate. Alright, so a disclaimer and backstory. At no point do I see the aforementioned creature. I live in northern Pakistan, and it's a lot like the northern US or central Europe in terms of geography and environment. It is predominantly Islamic with a Hindu background. We have a lot of superstitious beliefs, such as witches. There's a name for it in our language, with similar abilities to skinwalkers, demons as well as witchcraft magic. I am aware that skinwalkers are native to North America, but flesh gates, they are an internet thing, I know I know, not exclusive to North America. I don't live in the countryside, but I have a farm that I visit almost every weekend. It's less agriculture, more pleasure. The farm is located in a community of farms, and to the north is a large patch of unclaimed forest, probably 
200 acres, if not bigger. The forest is populated. Porcupine, wild boar, foxes, coyotes, apart from wild dogs. I've been doing a lot of hunting in my time there, and have never experienced anything like this before. I used to hunt at night alone quite a bit prior to this happening. I was hunting at night, about one in the morning, which is also around the time wild boar are the most active, being nocturnal and all. I shot an adult female, probably around 350. Since it was getting late, I decided to remove the body the next morning. Most Pakistanis are Muslims, so we don't eat them, and we hunt boar because they have a habit of messing about the crops and livestock. We have to remove the body legally and move it to a government dumping ground. I placed a marker and went back home. Nothing creepy at all happened on the way back. Now, the next day at around noon, I headed back into the woods to remove the bodies. Forgot to mention, I shot a few in a few different places. The 350 female being the last, I make my way to the location of the last boar, and I start getting kind of creeped out. The woods had gone silent. No winds, birds, insects, anything. I started to get goosebumps, and a generally very uncomfortable feeling. I was being watched. When I got to the body, I saw in horror that this thing had been torn in half, with one half lying a good 15 feet away from the other. There was dried blood everywhere. But hear me out. It wasn't the blood itself that freaked me out. It was the fact that there was blood at all. Blood dries up in the veins of dead animals within 10 minutes of death, meaning that whatever did this had done it within 6 to 7 minutes of me leaving the body. The body had not been eaten. There were no scavengers feasting, which was strange to say the least. I decided to nope out of there real quick. I upholstered my pistol. I didn't have a rifle on me at the time and began speed walking out there, reciting a prayer and other Islamic verses meant to ward off evil. I am agnostic by the way, but at the time, I was praying to all the gods, lol. After about 10 minutes of walking, the uneasy feeling wore off, and the sound again returned to the forest. It was like a switch that had been clicked. I went home and just kind of blocked it all out. This happened a couple of months ago, but two days ago, there was a development. A week ago, there was an attack. A child of one of the workers at a neighboring farm went missing. He was nine. Two days ago, my father told me they found his decaying, mutilated corpse in the woods, not more than 50 yards from where my incident took place. My dad doesn't know about my incident. The kid's face had been ripped off, and his left leg was lying away from him. Police were called, and the place was blocked off. But this being Pakistani police, they chalked it up to a wild animal. The owner of the farm paid for an autopsy at a very expensive private hospital, but it came back inconclusive. All they knew was the kid had died of blood loss. The body again had not been touched by scavengers, despite sitting there for a few days in the wild, and was intact apart from the face and leg. The person that discovered the body, another man from the neighboring farm who was put hunting, he said he felt very uneasy, watched before he found the body. Look, I'm sure there's a rational explanation to all this and I'm probably jumping to conclusions. The events are most likely not connected. However, all I can say is I'm not going back in those woods again, not alone and not at night, even with somebody else. If you want any more specific details, I'll try and post updates. 
Story 18. Skinwalker or not. I'm not too familiar with skinwalkers. I'll admit that. I've only heard of them of virtue by growing up in the desert, as well as the casual fascination with spooky stories. This morning, I was busy meeting up with an old friend from high school, right around 1am, at a nearby park to booze and catch up on life, while walking around the field. We heard a loud repetitive noise coming from the margin of the park. No lights on. That I assumed to be a coyote, but it did not stop. It sounded almost like a soundbite of a child, wailing but choppily and perfectly repeated. The noise had a sort of mechanical element to it, if that makes sense. We would hear it for intervals of about 10 seconds, then it would stop for a few and then start back up again. We were both immediately changed, headed back for the car to change out in a parking lot. As we walked away towards the car, the noise ceased. Unfortunately, when we arrived at the parking lot, my friend realized he had forgotten his phone somewhere in the field where he had heard the strange, loud noise. We drove back and ran to go pick up the phone and found it. But when we entered the park, the noise started up again, but this time from a different corner of the park. Naturally, we bolted out of there, and the rest of the night was fine. After the encounter, I had brought up casually the idea of it being a possible skinwalker, and my friend even said that he had thought the same thing, but was afraid to bring it up. I was shaken to the core by the entirety of the experience. To reiterate, I'm no expert in the paranormal, so I can't really say whether my anxiety about the situation is all that valid. All I can say is that I have never heard something like that in all my life. You know, I'm eager to see if anybody could provide some possible insight into the whole experience or has been through anything remotely similar. Story 19 The Demon Things were just never quite the same after we moved out of the house that I had virtually grown up in almost my entire life. My dad, before retiring, was a real estate broker up here in northern Texas, and about a few years after I was born, I don't really remember anything before I was about three or four, we purchased this beautiful ranch-style home. This is also where my younger sister was born. We stayed in this house until we lost it in a foreclosure when I was 17. This was due to my dad getting very, very sick and my mom having to take off her work to take care of him full time. My dad would later pass away. I know those are our relevant details, but I'm sure they're going to get asked anyway, out of curiosity. Okay, let's move on. This house at first was like any other normal house, just your typical ranch-style American home. Life was pretty normal for my family and I, and my sister and I. But when I was about six, maybe seven, I started noticing some strange things going on in the house. The things being moved, chairs, furniture sliding across the house. Maybe not that dramatic sounding, but moving a couple inches, very visible to all the family members. My parents knew about it, but they chose not to acknowledge it. I think for the sake of not scaring me and my younger sister but we weren't blind to it. Then, the closet situation became a thing. Let me explain. At night, 8.30 was my bedtime. My mom would come in, tuck me in, both parents would come in and give me a kiss goodnight, tell me they loved me, and exit the room. It would usually take me a little while to fall asleep, but after some time, I would always hear this sound of like rustling and moving around from the inside my closet. Before I continue, let me just state that I never grew up watching horror movies or anything remotely scary. My family wasn't like that, so that was never even in my subconscious. So this was not some projection. Although for the most part, all I ever heard was noise. I never actually saw anything. 
and this happened on and off for a few years. Then, as I came to about maybe closer to nine, that's when I began seeing this being, as I call it, an entity, a demon, whatever you want to call it. Based on what it looked like, I guess it would be silly of me to refer to it as Slender Man, but as far as the dimensions of its limbs and its body and the shape, that's what it looked like. It obviously wasn't wearing a suit or anything, and it wasn't white. It was just a shadow, but it had very, very long limbs and legs, and a very, very slender body style, and red eyes. It would exit my closet, walk toward my bed, and just stand there, watching me sleep. I seen this thing walk on my closet multiple times, screaming and crying for my parents to come help me. The second they came in, poof, it was gone. They would usually console me, comfort me, with love and affection. As soon as they left, this thing never came back. But it would happen so many nights. I just got kind of used to it. Sometimes, I would wake up in the middle of the night to the feeling of something watching me. And when I did, it never felled. That thing was standing in the corner of my room, staring at me, not moving a muscle. Was it terrifying? 100%. As I got a little older, the encounter seemed to slow down, but my sister, the poor thing, had no shortage of seeing the same thing. A bit humorous, but I always imagined it having some sort of calendar and notebook form, writing down whose room it was going to visit for what night. It never attacked anybody, never touched us, never climbed in bed, never did hurt us. But it sure watched us a lot. And the older I got in that house, the more I grew up, I could just feel this heaviness lingering around the house. It's something I can never talk to my parents about. They refused to even acknowledge it. They wouldn't even answer questions about it. They straight up just pretended it didn't exist. Maybe that was just their way of dealing with it. You know, some people just aren't meant to handle every situation. That's how certain people are cut out. But as I got a little bit older, 12, 13, into my teenage years, I stopped seeing it as much, and it kind of just stopped showing up. But that heavy feeling that I would always get in the house, that presence, that lingering uneasiness, that never went away. So I could always feel it was around. You just kind of get used to it. And my sister, though, she would still see it, because she was about 14 when we lost the house. She would still see it almost nightly, actually. Why it stopped visiting me, I'm not sure. I mean, it's not like I ever stopped being terrified of this thing, whatever it was. So, that's why I just referred to it as a demon. But funny enough, as time would go on, and the whole Slenderman phenomenon came out, it was kind of disturbing to me, only because the resemblance was so uncanny. Sure, a slender man has a suit and is white, and this thing was more like a shadow person. There was no details like slender man, but the proportions were almost identical, very lanky and long. Slender man, to my recollection, also did not have red glowing eyes. After we lost the home, we moved across town to a cheaper place that my parents had enough money to afford and not keep us homeless, because we were about to be. The encounters and all the activity ceased with the move, so either this thing did not follow us, or there's just something wrong with that house. And judging by the amount of time that we had spent in that house with that thing being there, that's what I assume. So, is it possible the previous tenants practice witchcraft, or maybe something happened in that house. Somebody was killed, somebody died, who knows. All I know is, that demon, that being, that thing, still resides there, I'm sure. Story 20. The Hyena. It was a pretty chilly night here in Colorado, back in 1987. 
I had just wrapped up a session with a client and I was locking up the office for the night. As a psychologist, I have studied every aspect of the human brain, its functions, particularly those affecting behavior. My particular specialty in development is developmental psychology. This allows me to see a wide range of patients, from infants to adults. In all of my years of training and research, I have never seen anything so unreal, so disturbing as what was waiting for me in the alleyway that night. My keys clinged loudly in the stillness. I remember there was this strange, almost eerie mist rolling in and the moon shining down like the scene out of a movie, picturesque. After the door to my office had been securely locked up, I quickly slid the keys into my pocket and began walking to my tiny red little sedan. This was just around the corner on the other side of the building. I started down the sidewalk in frozen place as I heard metal collide against metal. For some reason, I'm honestly not sure why, perhaps propelled by my own foolish curiosity. I turned a glance over my shoulder, and that's when I saw it. Fear is a funny thing. It can take even the most intelligent people and turn them into fools. I remember walking toward it, as if being in a trance, like I was drawn to it. At first, I was under the impression it was a large stray dog, rummaging through the garbage cans. Being more of a cat person myself, this behavior disgusted me. But, seeing as dogs were fairly harmless, I thought I might just simply shoo it away. I continued toward the canine with extreme caution. Having been bitten by a neighbor's dog as a young child, I was slightly fearful, for good reason. Did you know the average bite force of a canine is roughly 230 to 250 PSI? I remember researching that shortly after the attack. I suspect it had more to do with smelling like my kitten than anything else. Animals usually had a love for me, despite having one sour experience. I don't hate my dogs, just preferred cats. The head that whipped up to look at me from the metal can was anything but interesting. It had a very weird face and actually reminded me of a hyena. It was more smashed though, very mesmerizing yellow eyes and kind of perked up ears. The head was very massive. I've never been very good at identifying dog breeds, but I was kind of in shock. I mean... There's an upright, large, walking hyena. I stepped forward a bit, still curious, but still feeling like I was drawn to it. Maybe a good seven feet away when suddenly, this dog, if we can even call it that, tipped itself fully upright onto its back legs. And I saw a human torso on its upper body, presumably male, given the chest and build. Tall, maybe eight or nine feet tall. The muscles were bulging, very well defined. When my mind could not figure it out, I simply screamed. I didn't mean to be so loud. The scream must have echoed. The creature let out a low growl. It was an awful sound, like a human dying, a brutal death mixed with these awful noises. I assumed this was it. I was going to die. It was logical to assume an impending attack was inevitable. As I ran in fright, I stumbled over my feet, and my hand caught the brunt of my weight. And I felt my hand, and I felt my skin along the underside of my hands. This is when it slid across the rough ground in between the buildings. This thing slowly approached me, well balanced on its hind legs, mind you, to make it all the more terrifying. From the midsection down, the human torso became that of a dog again, genetically. The entire makeup of this thing was wrong. It forced me to question everything 
I had ever been taught in school. As its massive head drew near to mine, I squeezed my eyes shut, preparing for the worst. My muscles tensed up all throughout my body, and my heart rate began to race. Then, much to my surprise, I felt hot breath on my face. But when I opened my eyes, it was gone. What was odd is that, despite the silence, I never even heard it move. There was nothing. For a few moments, I attempted to wrap my brain around the experience, but logically, there was no way I could formulate such a conclusion. I began to wonder, had I imagined the whole thing? Without allowing myself to think too much, I pushed myself up onto my feet and ran as fast as I could, off to my vehicle, which was a bit of a feat to pull off in high heels. I was lucky that neither of them broke off as I rushed to the car. How could I possibly be certain a creature like this wouldn't come back for me for dinner? Anyway, I was not going to stick around to find out. I pulled and shut the door, locking it. Then, I jammed my keys into the ignition, went into the reverse, and shot out of there. I never looked back. To this day, I still have no idea what sort of animal this was. Story 21 The Coyote It was around 4.30 a.m. when I saw something that looked just like the silhouette of a coyote. Just its head. But something was really wrong about it. Its head was bug enough to stretch to my other window pane. My window is about a foot, maybe a foot and a half. Now that thing that really scared the hell out of me is up to my window, maybe four feet off the ground, maybe five feet. Remember, coyotes are small. The silhouette's head was almost to the top of my window, and my window was open and unlocked. It still had the net in it, but all it had to do was tear it off. I don't know if it knew that I was awake. I had my blanket and hood over my head. I was staring at it, trying to be as still as I could. I was trying to calm down, so I sold myself the tree branches, or making it look like a head of a wild coyote, and that my mind was probably playing tricks on me. I mean, I was pretty tired. I eventually fell asleep, just from being exhausted. When I woke up, the window was still open, but there was mud or something on my window, like maybe something was trying to scratch and get in. My parents told me that my brother used to have nightmares. They think that maybe it was a spirit with bad intentions in our neighborhood. I've put a line of sea salt and said protecting words while I put it down with my mother. I locked and closed my curtains. I think that kept it away. After reading more about skinwalkers, I think it's time to start locking every door and window in the house. Every time I've stayed up as late as four, I have never seen it. I don't think it was trying to hurt me this time. It looked like it was just trying to watch me. After hearing that, it will come into your house. I want to know if anybody can help me keep it away permanently. Story 22 The Mothman I was born on November 29th, 1989. The same town the Mothman was created in, or so I grew up believing. Point Pleasant. I was about four years old at the time, and surprisingly, I remember it so well because of how traumatizing it was. Let me retract my previous statements. When I say grew up believing, I mean before the age of four, which really isn't growing up, I guess. But after this experience and realizing the severity of the reality, I was over at my grandmother's house watching TV. They were kind of more tucked away out of the city in the country. It was in the evening time, closer to dinner or after dinner. I don't remember. I had just got done playing 
and I remember I was watching TV. The power suddenly went out, all over the house. My grandmother walks in and says, Oh no, it's okay. Let me go see if we can go flip the breaker. And just then, out where we could see the windows, this large shape comes flying through the sky, right toward our house. So fast and so quickly, it made my grandmother scream, and she fell back startled. This thing flew up and landed on the roof of our house, causing a massive thud and shake. My grandmother began screaming, What is this? What is that? Wondering what this being was that had now taken over our entire roof. Of course, four-year-old me was crying because I was so scared. I didn't know what this was. I thought it was some big monster. After a couple of minutes of walking around, making all sorts of nasty sounds, it jumps down and we could see it right through our window. It's exactly like the illustrations you find online draw it out to be. Large and black, huge bat-like wings, and large, ominous red eyes. Except it's much more terrifying in person. It's a fear that grips your entire body, consumes your being. The only way I can describe it, the feeling is a primal fear. And I can remember those horrible screams of my grandmother. I've never heard her so terrified. After it looked in the window at us, it disappeared by flying off. I don't know where it came from. I don't know why it targeted our house. I don't know why the power went out right before it showed up. Maybe there's a connection between them. I'm not sure. And thinking back, I don't remember her turning the power back on or how that did come back on. But I definitely remember seeing this thing. That is forever marked in my brain as poor four-year-old me is forever traumatized. Story 23. The Shapeshifter. My son's new hobby is scaring me. My son got really into cataloging nature during the pandemic. He'll literally walk around our yard in the woods behind our house and write down all he sees, trying to describe all the plants and animals, even though they already have names like a little naturalist. Especially during the spring last year, when all the birds and bees began returning to the area after a long, cold, unpleasant winter. He got really into it. It's like a combination of his science teacher and the fact that the lockdown has forced him to stay home. He began noticing more things about the change of seasons, the little critters that live out, everything. As a parent, that part has been the absolute blast. Seeing him really connect with nature in a way and not just sitting on the couch staring at whatever episode of Cartoon Network is on. He started out just keeping tabs on whatever flowers I had in the garden and whatever cool bugs he found in the corners of the garage. But as soon as he became really fixated on this gopher in the backyard, at first I thought it was really cute. I don't know much about gophers, but my son seemed to be really able to get up and close and personal with this one. It also appeared to be pregnant. At least that's what I thought, since its belly was so huge. So I was even more taken aback that it wasn't aggressive or in any way territorial. So I was even more taken aback that it wasn't as aggressive or territorial when my son would literally just run up to it. That should have been red flag number one. But something started happening. I was reading through one of my son's animal books, half out of curiosity and half to see what he was reading. The book had a whole section of animal myths and legends. One entry was about skinwalkers, an old Navajo belief that there's a type of witch who can take the form of animals. At first, I thought it was interesting. But a few days later, I began to notice more and more weird behaviors that this gopher did that became kind of suspicious. I've always been superstitious. My husband even makes fun of me for it. But I swear, this gopher was way too comfortable 
for a wild animal around my son, especially if it was pregnant. He would play with the gopher, and I swear the gopher literally came to the door once, and the gopher would let him chase it all over. My biggest scare came when the gopher lured my son out of sight, and when I say lord, I literally mean lord. Yeah, a gopher. I mean, it runs past the house looking for him. Then, when he saw it and ran to go play with it, this thing just darted off behind the shed, and I could not see where they went. When my son did not reemerge for a few minutes, Mama's maternal instincts kicked in. I immediately dropped what I was doing and bolted behind the shed to see what was happening. To my horror, I saw my son trying to squeeze himself under the shed, into the gopher's hole. I yanked him back, asked him why he wanted to go down there. He just told me, because she told me she wanted me to see her house. When I asked him who told him that, he pointed on the hole to where the gopher had just entered. I pulled him back to the house and told him he was no longer allowed to go behind the shed, not like that without me again. Maybe I was overreacting, but that's how freaked out I was about this whole thing. But this is the end. The event that makes me lose sleep at night happened about a month after. One day, I heard rustling over by the same shed. Not really think much of it at first, I kind of smirked myself and thought, good, maybe something's hunting that gopher. Then... I immediately felt bad for thinking that. This was my son's favorite animal in the world. In a moment of sentimental stupidity, I went outside to try and fend off whatever was attacking that gopher. That's when I saw it. An old, decrepit woman, naked, covered in dirt, standing next to the hole. I gasped, dropping the coffee mug. I didn't know whether to run or to help the poor woman. But she smiled at me, lifted her finger, and pointed. I ran back inside, called the cops. They said they would be on their way immediately with an ambulance. They took her away, but while the car passed by her house, she kept staring at her house. At all, and the windows like she was trying to find somebody. I don't know what this was, or if there's any coincidence at all, or what. Is it possible that... She was some sort of shapeshifter. If you or anybody you know has a story they would like me to read or share with me, please send it to stories at whatlurksbeneath.com. I would love to read it. Thank you.